How are you guys? Are you excited to be here? Are you excited to blow some stuff up tomorrow? All right. Do we have any um, early firework fire offers? I've got beef with you because last night I could not sleep for the longest time. And I just have, I don't know, it bugs me to light a fireworks before the 4th of July. So if that's you, uh, we can still be friends, but I'd sure love to talk with you after service. That would be great. Normally we have a time of prayer, but this time we're just going to have chastising and discipline over fireworks. Uh, but that's okay. Uh, my name is Buddy. I'm on staff here. And if you're new with us, welcome. As Chris said, we are truly ecstatic. Um, we won't have you stand up so we can do a group bear hug. That didn't work out too well. The lawsuits piled up. Um, but we are glad you're here. If you're new with us, we're in the middle, towards the end actually, of Colossians. We've been going through the book of Colossians. So as I blabber, you can turn your Bibles or digital devices to Colossians 3. We're going to be in verses 17, and then we're going to dip into the first verse of chapter 4. And as you do that, I will pray. Jesus, thank you so much that we have an incredible country to live in. Uh, so many um, rights and privileges uh, that are found nowhere else on earth, Lord God. And so we just thank you for our freedom. God, we thank you for uh, the gift of this nation. We thank you for the people who have sacrificed so much, Lord, that we could live in freedom. God, we um, can't help but to apply that in a much truer and a more eternal sense to Christ. Lord, thank you for Jesus and his eternal sacrifice, his perfect sacrifice, Lord, that we can be citizens of heaven. We thank you for the rights and privileges that you have awarded us through Jesus our Lord. It's in his name we pray this. In his name we ask that you would just come alive through this text today. Amen. All right, let me read through and then we'll dive in. As I alluded to last week, I'm excited about this passage. Um, if I play this right, almost all of you will be offended by me by the time we leave. And I think that's kind of fun. Challenge accepted. So let's read. Colossians 3.17 just as a, a kind of a foundation. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be bitter toward them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged." Bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in sincerity of heart, fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord, not unto men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. But he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, give your bond servants what is just and fair, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Um, I've been listening to a book on tape, which is like the lazy way to read, right? Isn't that fun? And listening to this book on tape is all about life in outer space. And if you are a geek, it's, it's been the awesomest book. I'm, I, I hope awesomest is a word. It's been the neatest book. And I learned that there's such a thing as earth sickness. Have you guys heard of it? I was, I was unaccustomed to the term. So, um, for instance, I learned in the case of an, an astronaut named Peggy Whitson, who's a U.S. astronaut, Woohoo! she was a commander of the International Space Station. There's a space station in space. If you don't know much about space, we have a space station. It's pretty cool. And so she was a commander there and was in space, in orbit, outside of gravity for 192 days. Pretty neat. While you're in space, your muscles atrophy, you lose a lot of bone mass. It's just generally not a great place to live long term outside of the bounds of gravity. And to keep the International Space Station in space, it actually free falls continually. But if they get it far enough from the Earth's gravity and get it fast enough, it just falls sideways. So that's why things orbit the Earth. They're just perpetually falling, but in a horizontal manner instead of a vertical manner. Fascinating stuff. So this woman, Peggy, got so used to traveling at 17,500 miles an hour that that became her new normal. That was just the way that felt comfortable for her after these six months in space. And upon Earth, she experienced something called Earth sickness, which actually is pretty common among astronauts who have been outside of the bounds of our gravity for quite some time. And it's the exact same thing that we would experience uh, getting seasick. You get nauseous, you get dizzy, you don't feel well. Oftentimes, you become ill, you could even fall over. And so it's pretty fun if you'll watch astronaut interviews right after they return. Sometimes they'll just like keel over out of nowhere because they're so used to spinning that once they get on Earth, they feel as though they can actually feel the Earth's rotational speed and they feel like the Earth is 
is trying to spin them off of their center. And so it's fascinating that the, the planet which we call home is the very thing that they feel uncomfortable about. And today as we dig into what a Christ-honoring marriage looks like and what Christ-honoring relationships look like, Oftentimes, we in our culture have been so far away from the biblical text that, that the Bible actually seems wrong. And just like astronauts coming back to Earth, we struggle with it. We have this visceral reaction of negativity. Like, why would I willingly submit myself to someone? Do you realize what that means? And we have all of these emotions and thoughts go through our head. But the more time we can spend in the, the fruitful soil of God's word, the more comfortable we will become with this. And so my hope is that we won't become Bible sick when we talk about submission and interpersonal relationships, but we can take that verse 17 to heart and recognize that in everything we do, we can honor Christ through those relationships, particularly in marriage, that in word or deed, we do all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So obviously, Paul wrote Colossians. Paul wrote another book, Ephesians. And in Ephesians 5, uh, let's do like 18 through 33, is the sister or the parallel passage to this verse. It talks a lot about wives and husbands and relationships, and it applies it probably a little bit better towards the spiritual end of things. So I'll be referencing Ephesians 5 quite often. I'm not going to read the whole thing. I really would just encourage you guys to do so. Ephesians 5, 18 through 33 this week. Go read it. Talk to your friends, your boss, your coworkers, your subordinates, your wife, your children. Figure out what it means for you guys. But first off, I have been really excited to preach about this passage. I think this is one of the most beautiful passages about what a relationship, a marriage can actually look like and how good it can be. And marriage can be incredible or it can be really terrible. And I just, I'm so excited that there's so much fruit in here. There's so much life. There's so much Christ-honoring potential in our relationships here on this world that if we will try to recognize that our salvation can work its way, not just into church, but into our marriage, like into the nitty-gritty hard stuff of life, like that's where the fruit of our salvation is. It's not that we do religious things, but it's that it makes manifest the fruit of the Spirit in all situations in life. And when we see that occur and recognize, like, I can't behave this well, like this is Christ in me, it's very, very exciting for me. And so as we dig in, like, I'm just, I'm thrilled but I also recognize that these verses come with a lot of liability. Like a lot of us hate the word submission in any context. A lot of us have a lot of um, possibly even religious baggage from this. Perhaps we've had terrible experiences. Perhaps we've sat under really um, judgmental or condemning teaching over these passages. So often these are so misinterpreted and misapplied. And man, I hope by the grace of God we'll be able to rightly divide his word today. And so let's jump into the first relationship that Paul wants us to learn about. Wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. I love that that first word, we're going to break this down, is a definitive article. We're just talking about wives here. So if you're not married yet, if you're a young woman and you're just waiting for the day and you've got it all planned out in your head and you've got it all listed down and you know what colors you're going to have and what music you're going to walk down to the aisle to and who your bridesmaids are going to be, oh, one of the coolest things about scripture is that it can prepare you for that relationship. Like our culture tells you that it's all about um, almost a lust, that you will be so emotionally captivated by your spouse and that'll just last for forever and then when it doesn't or fizzles, you check out and you find another one that does. And that's not what scripture teaches. Scripture teaches us to submit to one another and teach, te te scripture teaches us to stick with one another and to love one another as Christ loved us. And so uh, for you who are not yet married, like please don't check out of this, but recognize like this is preparation for your future. And if you are looking forward to that day, then, then I feel like this is heavily applicable to your lives. And what I do want to recognize, a lot of the, the power of this text is what it doesn't say. So here is what it doesn't say. Women submit to all men as is fitting to the Lord. What it does say is wives submit to your own husband as is fitting to the Lord. And one of the neat things that we find, uh, particularly in the New Testament, which was totally against the culture of its day, was that it teaches full equality in the kingdom of Christ. Once you are in the light of Christ, we're, we're equal. We're all sons and daughters of his, and that there's, there's no one greater or lesser than the other. It, again and again and again, Scripture goes back to it. Like, it doesn't matter if you're male or female or Greek or Jew or circumcised or uncircumcised or a barbarian or Scythian. It, it doesn't matter what you feel like you are because we are all equal in the sight of God when we are his. And I think that's so cool that we find over and over equality 
particularly among the genders in Scripture. And so this is not a call for all women to submit to all men at all time. That, that is not in the counsel of Scripture. What we do see here is in the context of marriage, wives, you are asked to play a role of submission to the role of the husband. And I think that's really hard. And I have an incredible wife. Man, I love my wife, but she has a very strong constitution. And I don't say that as if it's a liability of hers. I say that it's her strength. Like she, she's a very strong-willed, independent, self-sufficient human being. And that's something to be celebrated. And so for our relationship, like these verses are, are not just something that you immediately take and understand how to apply, but these take some fleshing out. And I think that's pretty fun. So wives, God is asking you to submit. That's not a fun word. It's not a popular message these days. But this submit word means to come under, to place under in rank. Paul borrowed a military term here. Paul's not saying, wives, view yourself as less than. He's not saying, wives, you're, you're not worthy of leading. All he's saying is, would you willingly submit to your husband as God has called him into the position of leadership? Often enough, um, us guys, at least personally speaking, I feel less qualified to lead in my marriage occasionally than my wife is. Man, she is so sensitive to the spirit. She is so strong. She makes such good decisions quickly. And oftentimes I feel like, man, just going by natural gifting, there are areas where my wife is a better leader than I am. But that's okay because God has asked me to fill a role in the relationship. And we can complement one another as we continue to submit primarily to God and as my wife submits to the leadership role that God has asked me as a husband to fulfill in our marriage. And so wives, God is asking you to submit to your own husband. Again, not all men, but to your own husband, as is fitting to the Lord. I love this verse. This whole, this whole thing is beautiful because God is showing equality. God is showing you that it's just in the context of your marriage, and God is showing you the motivation behind this, that as we plow through each one of these relationships, ultimately it's just all about Jesus. We're going to say that so much from the stage that you will just have it pounded into your brain, that wives, you're not submitting to your husband because he's better than you are. You might not even be submitting to him because he's naturally more qualified to be a leader, but you're submitting to your husband because you love Jesus. And as your ultimate authority, your Lord has asked you to submit to your husband. Husbands have read this often, particularly this verse has been most abused out of the passage, and said, oh, you need to submit to me as if I were the Lord. That's, that's not what Scripture says ever. Wives, on the other hand, perhaps in a spirit of rebellion, have said, I will only submit to you if you're behaving totally perfectly like the Lord, and I can absolutely trust that you're following his discernment, and in all other cases, I have the right to rebel against you. That's not what Scripture says either, but what Scripture does say is, wives, your husband can be a bonehead. He can be really hard-headed. He can be hard to talk to and emotionally really distant and a poor communicator, and despite all of that, because of your love and submission for Christ, God is asking you to play a role of submission to your husband. And in the midst of that struggle and fleshing that out, you will learn so much about your relationship with your Father in heaven. What I love about verse 18, which took me an embarrassing long time to recognize, is this is just only has to do between the Lord and wives. Husbands, stay out of this. Don't force your wife to voluntarily submit to you. Try to figure out how that works logically. But instead, God is asking your wives to have an encounter with him to the extent that they will be willing to submit to you as husbands. And you as husbands, your role is to focus on what you're called to do. Your role is to support and to love and to pray for your wife. Your role is not to Bible bash your wife. Your role is not to abuse scripture and say you're worth more in God's eyes. That is incorrect. But instead, your role, husbands, is to love your wives in verse 19 and do not be bitter towards them. Just a footnote too, also in the submission part in verse 18, what I do like about it is we have no clear definition of what submission looks like. The way my wife submits to me in the role of our relationship looks different than your relationship does, and that's awesome. Like we get to work this out together as a married couple before the Lord, working to strive to honor him in all we say and do. And I think that's awesome. Like this isn't some cookie cutter wife role that you have to do these things, but instead it's like God's just asking you, Figure out in your marriage what submission looks like and how you best can honor God as a complementary team, and God will be glorified, and that's really cool. And in the midst of that, again, husbands, love your wives. This love word is agape. Oftentimes, we talk about this as the like, unconditional, divine, everlasting love of God towards men, and that's totally true. But I was like, really fascinated to learn this week that agape can actually be used in really detrimental terms. John 3, 19, Jesus is talking about light coming into the world, and he says, but here's the condemnation, that men agape darkness 
and they rejected the light. So, so people loved sin so much that they poured themselves out, that they gave themselves unconditionally to sin, to, to their detriment, to their death they gave themselves. It's a really negative connotation to this agape word, but, but the truth of the heart of agape love is that selfless love. It's, it's this pouring out. It's, it's giving love even when it's not reciprocated, giving love even if it kills you. In the case of sin, spiritually, it does. And then when we apply this agape word to our love of Christ, man, we can learn so much about what God is calling us to do. And the more husbands we learn what God is calling us to do, the more we realize we don't even have time to micromanage our wives because this bar is so high. In light of the love of Jesus Christ, God is calling you to love your wives that way. Ephesians 5 says it well, that that we ought to love our wives as Christ did, who gave himself up for the church. It's interesting that uh, generally, speaking at least for my own self, like, if I had my sinful way, I would be the king of my castle, right? And my home would be my castle, and I'd come home from work, and dinner would be ready, and my wife would just be happy to talk to me and make me feel like Mr. Macho King, and the kids would be well-behaved if we had some, and it would be all self-serving and all revolving around me, and I would lord it over, and I would use it to make sure my wife was meeting my needs and really not really care about her needs. That's kind of how us guys just naturally are dispositioned to, to behave. And instead, we're, we're called to love like Christ loved. We're called to humble ourselves. Instead of lording our position over our wives, we're called to to humble like Jesus did and come underneath, to care more for our wife's wants and desires than we do about ours, to unconditionally pour out this love, to continue to validate our wife's worth, her innate beauty in her eyes, just as Christ does for us. Over and over again, we see this love of Christ say, you're holy, you're pure, you're saints, you're washed, you're cleansed. Like, forget about your mess-ups. You're beautiful in my eyes is the message of Christ in the New Testament. And husbands here at Anthem, that is the love, that is the message that we need to communicate unconditionally, unwaveringly towards our wives. This isn't an emotional affection. This goes so much deeper than physical attraction. Like, this is a long-term commitment of emotionally embracing your wife, regardless of how she responds or how she looks or what she says or what she doesn't do, that you choose to love your wife forever unconditionally. And it's so cool that the ultimate motivating factor behind this is recognizing that this love, husbands, we receive from Christ Jesus. That he continues to say we're okay, that we're better than okay, that we're very good. He continues to pour out his love for us despite how well we do or don't perform for him on any given week. And the more we recognize this unconditional, continual flow of love from Christ, the more we recognize we cannot give agape love to our wives unless we are thriving in Jesus Christ ourselves. And so this love motivates us to get on our knees before God. I cannot love my wife the way God wants me to if I'm in poor relationship with Jesus. I need Jesus to love my, life, my wife well, and you need Jesus to love your wife well. And finally, husbands, do not be bitter towards your wives. Man, so often, uh, and unfortunately, there seem to be a lot of marriages, particularly in the church, that just are so unhealthy and unhappy. Oh, we're in this for long haul because it'd be a sin if we divorced. And they just, they don't seem like they love each other. Oh, I love her, but I don't really like her, right? And like, how does that even work? Like, that just does not fly. Husbands, we understand the extent of our brokenness. We understand that once we have possessed something, that we have wandering eyes and we want to move on. We understand that we have divided hearts, that we have lustful appetites in our flesh, and it is so easy for us to to just take our wife for granted and wish we had more, wish we had something else, something different. And so often we see this bitterness in a man's heart that they almost feel like their wife, the greatest treasure they have, they feel like she's holding them back or keeping them down or they just wish she was like so-and-so or like she was back when they were dating. And, And so many men become so embittered towards their wives. They allow this unforgiveness to grow bitterness towards the person they have given their life to. And that is so detrimental in marriage. Men, we need to learn how to love our wives as Christ loved the church. Husbands, I challenge you, read Ephesians 5 this week. If you want to learn more about agape love, read 1 Corinthians 13. It says this, using the same word agape. Agape suffers long and is kind. Agape does not envy It does not parade itself. It is not puffed up. 
It does not behave rudely. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked. Agape love thinks no evil. It does not rejoice in iniquity, but it rejoices in the truth. It bears all things. It believes all things. It hopes all things, and it endures all things. Agape love never fails. That is the love we experience from Jesus as believers in Christ. And husbands, that is the love that you are challenged to flow out of your heart and give towards your wife and your family as you become a leader. And I hope that we as men here at church can recognize how to do that. Verse 20, children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. Well, that's kind of a bummer verse if you're a kid, huh? Like, man, can I just, can I obey them in most things? if it's well-pleasing to the Lord. And even as we go through this, kids, like if you are a child of a parent and you're under the roof and under your care, like you are just called to obey them. Like if you say you're a Christian, then Jesus is commanding you to obey your parents in all things. Why? Not because your parents are the best, not because your parents never make mistakes, but because it's pleasing to God when you obey your parents. Because ultimately, you're learning obeying your heavenly Father in heaven. I think that is so cool that in every relational context, we can apply the truth of our Father in heaven to it. Do you want, do you want to love your wife? Awesome, because Christ loves you in that way. Do you want to submit to your husband? Awesome, because we submit to Christ in that same way. And as a footnote, man, husbands, if you love your wife with agape love, if you are not embittered towards her, you will be a much, much, much easier man to give respect to. And wives, if you are respecting your husband, you will be much, much easier to love and not be embittered against. And kids, as your husband, as your, I'm sorry, kids, as your dad and your mom are dealing with all that stuff, like, don't exasperate them. Like, they've got enough on their plate. Like, just let's obey our parents, all right? There's a cool passage uh, in Hebrews 12. I'm going to read a paraphrase because we're talking to kids after all, right? Uh, this is what I read, so I'm not really actually knocking on you kids. Hebrews 12, 5 through 11. Have you forgotten the encouraging words that God spoke to you as his children? He said, my child, don't make light of the Lord's discipline. And don't give up when he corrects you. For the Lord disciplines those he loves, and he punishes each one he accepts as a child. As you endure this divine discipline, remember that God is treating you as his own children. Who has ever heard of a child who has never been disciplined by his father? If God doesn't discipline you as he does the rest of his children, then it means you're illegitimate and you're not really his child. Since we respected our earthly fathers who disciplined us, shouldn't we even submit more to the discipline of our father in heaven? Verse 10, for our earthly fathers, they disciplined us for a few years. They did the best that they knew how. But God's discipline is always good for us so that we might share in his holiness. No discipline is enjoyable while it is happening. It's painful, but afterwards, there will be a peaceful harvest of right living for those who are trained in this way. So kids, if you think your parents are out of touch, out of date, don't really understand the new world and what's going on, be patient with them. God is calling you as his child to submit to the authority that your parents have over you. And you can learn about your father in heaven through your earthly father. And on that line, verse 21, fathers, earthly fathers, do not provoke your children lest they become discouraged. I cannot tell you how excited I am to speak about parenting verses from firsthand experiences. Until that day comes, I look back on my childhood, and man, my earthly father is awesome. So cool. Man, he was ultra strict, had really high expectations that he communicated regularly towards me. But you know what he also did really well? I always knew he loved me, and he said it often and repetitively, and he was so creative in showing his affection towards me and his pride in me as I matured and became a young man, and that is powerful, dads. Tell your kids you love them. Tell your kids that you are proud of them. That is is so impactful in the life of a developing human being. That forevermore, as long as they live, people carry either the successes of natural parenthood or the scars of earthly parents and poor discipline. It's fascinating, as I researched this, the um, reformer Martin Luther, that famous guy back in the Reformation, he always, for decades, for the rest of his life after he was out of the home, couldn't say the Lord's Prayer because the Our Father in Heaven part really tripped him up. He just could not marry the idea of his earthly, strict, abusive father with the idea of a father in heaven who loved him. He just messed him up for the rest of his life. And dads, you carry so much weight in particular in the parenting role here. Man, my hope is you won't just be totally permissive and let your kids do everything. My hope is also that you won't just be an authoritarian, 
What's that word? Authoritarian and a disciplinarian figure in their lives, but you will communicate your love and your affection and the worth of your children in your eyes and that they will know forever that you care for them because ultimately you are role modeling the Father in heaven. And if that man isn't a terrifying challenge in your lives, I don't know what is, that we need Jesus desperately to fulfill these roles of leadership, men, that God is calling us towards. And if you do it well, man, your kids will be light years ahead of the game and recognizing a loving heavenly father. And if you do it poorly, it will take a lifetime to get over those scars as God heals and teaches your children the truth about a loving, consistent father. Verse 22, bond servants, literally slaves, Greek word doulos, someone who is possessed, who is owned by another person. These weren't viewed as people, these were viewed as possessions. They, they couldn't own anything on earth because they themselves were a possession. If they had children, they automatically reverted ownership back to the slave owner. It was horrible, it was abhorrent, it was nothing that the Bible promotes. But more than half of the Roman civilization were these slaves. And so Paul is dealing with something that is um, systemic in their culture. The Bible does not encourage or endorse slavery. The Bible talks about a lot of stuff that's messed up. Murder, incest, all sorts of stuff. It doesn't endorse it simply because it talks about it. Verses like this were used as proof texts by believing slave owners in the early American days, and that's disgusting. But what the Bible is dealing with is the truth of their culture in the day, that most of them lived in these tough relationships, these unjust situations. And even in the hardest of our relationships, Paul is saying Jesus can be glorified. Even when you have better rights and you should have more privileges and you ought not be treated that way, even in that tough scenario, you can have an, art, an attitude in your heart that glorifies Jesus. And I think this is so encouraging when he says, bond servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. Interestingly, we'll get to this next week at the end of the chapter. One of the dudes who delivered the letter to this church in Colossae was himself a slave. His name was Onesimus. You can read about him in the book in Philemon. He had actually ran away from his slave owner, which is pretty big deal, uh, somehow got in connection with Paul, received Christ, and was actually being sent back to face the consequences of running away and to go back to his slave owner. And so, like, Paul's just not writing about, oh, this would be really cool in a theoretic sense if slaves could have a Christ-like attitude. Like, Paul knows this dude. Paul loves this dude. Paul endorses this dude as a peer and an equal and a brother in Christ, and this guy is delivering this letter. Can you imagine how much weight there was behind this when they read, bond servants, Obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. And here we go. Don't do it just with eye service. Don't, don't look good when people are looking at you, but do it always. Don't do it as men pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing God. Again and again, in each relationship, Paul takes it back to the basics. You're doing this because you fear God. You're not doing this because slavery is just. You're not doing this because your taskmaster happens to be a very equitable person. You're doing this ultimately because God in heaven is asking you to do this. The ultimate authority is asking you to submit and to work with integrity and passion with all of your might towards the endeavors that you are being tasked to do. And I think that's awesome. And in today's context, obviously in a much lesser sense, like we can do, uh, we can utilize this text in terms of schooling with teachers and college with professors and in our jobs with people in authority over us, that we don't have to just um, hate them, we don't have to despise them, but we can actually show them the light of Christ as we submit and work wholeheartedly towards whatever the end goal is. And I think that's awesome. But we'd not, we ought not do it with eye service as men pleasers. Back in junior high, I ran track, uh, not for very long, thankfully, and um, each day we had the warm-up of running a mile, an entire mile, like, that's horrible. And so, um, what most of us would do uh, would be, there was this storage shed out by the track, and so we'd take off and run about 50 yards and then stop behind the storage shed, wait for all the goody two-shoes to run their laps, right? And then we'd join them right at the end and pretend to be out of breath and sweaty. I actually was out of breath and sweaty for like 50 yards, that was my limit. And then one day the track coach caught us, and man, talk about a righteously indignant person. The dude lit us up. I mean, he just, you know, the point where people are like red in the face and yelling that so much saliva is just excreting from their mouth, you're like, wow, this is really neat to watch. Like, I don't know, I just, I'm messed up. When people yell at me, which happens to be often, I just, it's really neat to watch people lose their temper. And so I was wondering how red his face would get and why he was so angry and just wondering if like, he was faking being mad because like, that was his role as track coach. 
But it turns out, like, no, he, this guy was, was pretty upset. And the cool thing was, despite all of my inner monologue going on, was that I recognized that this guy was passionate about integrity. And the message that finally got through my thick skull was that he, he was displaying this message. Like, you can, you can fool your track coach. You can pretend that you have a good attitude at work, but you know you're goofing off. You know you're not being a good steward of your time. But the truth is that if you really love God, you'll recognize you're working unto him. You're actually a representative of God in heaven. When you're slacking off, when you're not doing things well, when you have double standards, that you act one way in front of people and you act a different way when you're by yourself, like God recognizes that. God sees the lack of integrity in your heart and he is not pleased with it. But instead, we are encouraged with all sincerity of heart to obey these people while fearing God, that he is the ultimate motivating factor behind this all. Verse 23, and whatever you do, do it heartily as unto the Lord, not unto men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. Isn't that cool? Like in any relationship you can imagine, in any circumstance in your life, Jesus can be present and Jesus can be glorified through your attitude and through your actions. I think that's awesome. In the most unjust of circumstances, you can glorify Christ. In the marriage context, you can glorify Christ. Disciplining your kids, you can glorify Christ. Receiving discipline from your parents, you can glorify Christ. I've, all of it is unto the Lord, and that's so cool. And then as these, particularly as these slaves are challenged to do this as unto the Lord, knowing that from the Lord they will receive a rich inheritance, they must have been blown away. Like, you've taken someone who's not considered a person, who can never own anything ever in their entire life, and you've said, God knows you, and he sees your condition, and he loves you, and he values you, and not only that, but if you will obey him, he will give you an, an eternal inheritance from heaven. And how cool is that? You've gone from not owning anything, abject poverty, to the riches of heaven because of this, this extravagant love of the Father. How much more should we apply this truth in our relationships today. But on the other side, verse 25, but he who does not, he who does wrong will be repaid for what he has done. There is no partiality. God knows. God knows the condition of your heart. He is a just judge. Finally, verse 4, or chapter 4, verse 1, masters, give your bondservants what is just and fair, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Again, whatever role you play in any relationship, your motivating factor should be, how can Jesus be glorified in this? If you find yourself in a position of authority or influence over others, like do it in such a way that you exemplify the benevolent authority of Christ in our world. You don't lord it over them. You don't manipulate them. You don't use them for your advantage, but you seek their good. You seek justice. You seek equity in these relationships. And in doing so, you stand in direct contrast to the authority of this world, which rules over and subjugates people. And instead of that terrible model, you come underneath people and you seek what's best for them and you seek justice and love and peace in these relationships and that will get people's attention. And that is such an incredible doorway to share Christ in their lives. And why are you such a good boss to me? Oh, that's easy. Because Christ Jesus is my ultimate master and I'm serving him and I'd love to tell you more about him in our lives. The cool word with this doulos, this slave, this bond servant word that begins in verse 22 more often than not in the New Testament when it's used, it's used using the relationship between us and Christ Jesus. And in the context of the Roman Empire, it was obviously like a hated word. Nobody wanted to be a slave. But in context of the New Testament, it is a word that carries a lot of honor and dignity with it. Do you know what I am? I'm a possession of the Lord Most High. Do you know what I do? I work for God Almighty in heaven. And so as we view ourselves as bond servants of Christ, Man, we recognize it. it's, it's our responsibility to do his work in this world, to do it heartily, not as unto men, but as unto the Lord with full integrity and sincerity of heart. And he will give us what we need in these relationships. As we scroll through again in, in these verses, seven times it links it all back to the Lord. Wives submit as is fitting to the Lord. Children obey your parents as is pleasing to the Lord. Bond servants don't work for men, but fearing God, do it as unto the Lord, because from the Lord you'll receive an inheritance. So serve the Lord Jesus Christ. Masters, do these things because you have a master in heaven. That all comes back to the motivation of Jesus Christ in our lives. That this radical transformation that we call salvation, it influences everything. And the challenge behind that is if it's not influencing parts of your life, why? 
Why are you barring Christ's transformation in areas of your life? Allow him to come in. Allow him to transform. Allow yourself to submit to the lordship of Christ in your life. And so much life and love and peace will flow through those areas. It will astonish you. And my prayer, Anthem, is that we will be a church that just perfectly radiates Christ's love in our relationships. That will get the world's attention. That will build such intrigue that they will just wonder, what makes you different? And then your job is easy. You just say, it's Jesus. It's all about Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, you're so good. God, we just want to ascribe you the praise and the honor and the glory that is rightfully yours for all of eternity. Lord, we are so thrilled to have had our eyes opened, to have had our hearts transplanted. Lord God, to have put off the old self and to be clothed in the righteousness of Christ. Lord, your salvation is so good. I pray that you would teach us more about the truth of this transformation. God, I pray that you would help us to apply it in more real and universal ways in our life. God, I pray that as Anthem seeks to honor you in all things, that in particular our relationships would do that. Jesus, in areas of injustice, I pray that you would still help us to submit ultimately to you. Lord, I pray that our marriages would be strong and be firm, would be durable, and that primarily they'd be founded upon a loving relationship with Jesus Christ. Lord, for the kids here, and there are plenty of them, thank you, God. What a blessing. Pray you'd bring us more. Lord, I pray that you would anoint our kids, that you would set them apart, that you would uh, just pour your spirit out upon them in abundance, that you would gift them, that you would call and equip them, that they would be world changers for you, Lord God. We just plead that they would love you and serve you all of the days of their lives. Help us as parents, particularly help us as dads, to know how best to demonstrate the love of the Father to our kids. Show us uh, the line between encouragement and discipline. Help us to love well, Lord God. And thank you so much for your spirit to lead and to guide us in all of these endeavors. Again, Jesus, we love you so much. Pray this in your name. Amen.